Hello, everyone, and welcome to our live today. Happy Monday. It's a beautiful day. Um, it is a little muggy, but it's still really nice outside. Um, we're going to continue talking about the IEP toolkit and things that help you understand where your child is. Um, we started talking about testing last week and what um, the different uh, tests are uh, for reading. And today we're going to talk about the bell curve. The bell curve is really, really powerful and a lot of times misunderstood by parents and it can cause them to go into a total panic um, because they're not sure exactly what they're looking at. So today we are you can see the, uh, right there and we're going to talk about it and what it means and try to help you understand so that you can really be supportive um, and an effective advocate for your child. So bell curves are used to compare scores, measure progress, measure effectiveness, and it also allows comparison between one child and other children or one skill and other skills with uh, one child. Um, so it can really help by doing the, this visual map or graph of additional information. So um, it's most commonly used to see what one child does compared to their peer group. Um, it measures effectiveness um, when you see an individual or a group uh, improve as a whole. Uh, if the if the, whatever the skill is, you see an improvement of the whole group after an intervention, um, it would be very obvious if you were looking at it on a bell curve. Uh, it measures progress, as I mentioned, um, by if you look at it, this bottom part, x-axis, and then the top one is the y, uh, or the up and down one would be the y-axis. And, and then after you chart everything, then you can convert them into percentiles with the mean or the average being Middle being the most common score of the students or the children taking the test is going to be the 50%. And then you're going to go up or down from there where the second most frequent scores um, are go down a little bit from the middle and then the third go continue to go down. And then if there are more, it continues to go down. So it's really important. So let's say that they take a test and out of the 20 questions on the test, um, most of the kids get 10 correct. That means that they are in the 50th percentile, as you see right there. There were a few kids um, who got 13 correct. And so they are considered to be in the 84th percentile and 16 of the 20 kids um, we're in the 98th percentile. Actually, it would be, it would, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Um, and then there would be a, a, a group of children who got 16 out of 20, and that would be the 98th percentile of this particular uh, population. Uh, so when you see sometimes, um, when you see these kinds of scores, you know, you're, you're, you can't say, oh my God, my child is in the 50th percentile. That isn't what this means. That means that if, that in this particular group of students, 50% of them did better and 50% of them did worse or 49 and 49, however you want to do it. So if you're looking at the 84 percentile population, those, you know, of that group of kids had 16% uh, of the class did better than them and 83% did worse than them. So it's really important to not immediately go off the rails that your child is failing. 
It just means that there's kids that did better and kids that did worse. Okay, do not think for one minute that that 50 percentile is a D or a C or an F or whatever. Um, so you have to really understand that. Um, a lot, there are several different kinds of scores. The first one is a raw score. The raw score is the actual number of items that were correctly answered or performed. Um, so if someone uh, answers 10 questions correctly, their raw score is 10. Um, and they would be in the middle of the class as we talked about as half of the students did more than 10 and half did less than 10. Um, so the, and then this, this percentile is called a percentile rank or PR. You know, everything has abbreviations and acronyms in this world. So, um, and then, you know, the child that got a seven or is in this, has a percentile rank of 16%, that child got seven answers correct on, on, on the, of the task or of the test. And then you see that if someone um, had 17, that would put them in as, their percentile rank would be in 99 because you see the 16 is 98. So 17 would be 99 um, and continue to go up. You can, as I mentioned before, this is very effective for comparing your child to other children. Um, again, remember it's the number that did better and the number that did worse. It is not a percentage. Um, you can look at where your child is as far as this percentile rank uh, in September, again, in giving them the same assignment or same task in, you know, November, give it again in January, give it again in March, give it again in June. And you would be able to tell very clearly if your child is making progress or not. So it's a great measure of progress. It also, as I mentioned earlier, um, allows you to compare groups. So if you're comparing second graders to third graders, you could put them all on here and see where they fall if there were, um, and you could do it in a way so that you could see, you know, you use blue dots for the um, for the, the third graders and you use whatever color I had, um, green dots for the third graders. Um, and here, let me just draw this really quick. So if your, if your blue dots are, and I'm sorry, that is a little bit hard to see, but if your, if your blue dots represent your third graders and your green dots represent your fourth graders, as you can see, the fourth graders are doing much better on the test than the third graders, but the mean is still 10. So you have the same amount of third graders and fourth graders who are getting 10 or 50 or in the 50th percentile rank, but then you see that in the higher percentile ranks, the fourth graders did better, which is what you would expect because um, they've had more education. So that's a, just a really helpful tool to use and to analyze and to compare. And a lot of education, as you know, is based on comparison. So this is a little special issue we run into with children with disabilities, and that is between kindergarten and first grade. A lot of times kids are held back from first grade who have disabilities, and um, oops, 
So, um, and a lot of times um, we hear parents say that they're going to hold them back because of immaturity. Um, I would assert to you that it may not be uh, immaturity. Um, and in most cases, um, if the child is held back, then they get a year of readiness is what they call it. Um, but you have to make sure that they're not trying to meet the goals of the year before. They're now learning it for the second time. So you wanna make sure that they're being compared to children of their same age, not their same grade. And that's really important. So um, other ways that test scores are reported are with obviously percentile ranks. We've already talked about age equivalents. We talked about um, grade equivalents. It's obvious. Raw scar scores we talked about. Um, the Now we're going to talk a little bit about scaled scores. Scaled scores are weighted and they convert a, a child's raw score, excuse me, into a scale score. And it allows you to compare uh, scores of many different subtests um, into one number and then compare that to others. So it's like a rank order system. And so if you score the highest in one event, then that highest event score is 100. The lowest event score is a one. And then you kind of rank the rest of them in between. So if they're converted, then you can tell what, some, what a child's strengths are and what their weaknesses are. Um, and that is really helpful um, when you're trying to formulate an IEP or any sort of individualized education, because then you know where you need to go to to support that child. Um, if there's composite scores, composite scores are what we see on most educational and psychological tests, because they all they all have subtests as part of them. And um, the difference. Um, in the achievement on the individual subtests doesn't matter. Like if they got that, that isn't how you look at it and it doesn't matter. The, the scores are all combined and then you get a composite score and you can't rely solely on the composite score. That can cause problems because you're not comparing apples to apples because not all children are given the same subtests. So um, that's really important. There's also something called subtest scatter. Subtest scatter is the difference between the highest and the lowest subset, subtest scores. And that's when you have a child who scores 98 in reading and three in math. That would be subtest scatter because there's it's so obvious right off the bat which, um, where their strengths and weaknesses are and what needs to be addressed. So that's really, really important. Um, most subtests do use an average mean of 10. They do use the bell curve. The 10 becomes the 50th percentile rank. And, and if you have scatter, then that's an unreliable way to determine um, what the other score should be. It does help you to figure out if there's additional testing that's necessary or if there's other things that should be done to help that child, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and how to get it to a place where they're um, scoring average or above average in every subject matter so they can have a composite score that is reflective and accurate for other decisions to be made. Think about the ACT. And you know, sometimes they, they add all those scores together and that's your composite score. Or there's super scoring where, the, where they'll take the best reading, the best math, the best writing, the best science, whatever it is, 
and they add all those together and that's what they use because they you know are believing in humans and that we're not all our best in every subject and every day so that's really important um, and you should use all of this information um, and really use the bell curve and convert the information and do all the comparisons so that you know exactly which skills of your child's need to be strengthened and what strengths need to be harnessed to help remediate the weaknesses. Um, so tests and measurements um, give you answers to a lot of important questions. So the next thing that we're gonna learn about and we're gonna learn about it tomorrow there are more tests and measurements. Um, we'll talk about the WISC4, which is the Weschler Intelligence Scale for Children, um, otherwise known as the IQ test. And we'll talk about some of the other um, behavior rating and speech and language tests and more in depth about composite scores and, and more and we'll, we'll do some more examples of bell curve with standard deviation and um and so that's what we're going to do tomorrow and then um we'll develop some other topics towards the end of the week uh so for now i know today was kind of a short day but the the bell curve is pretty confusing and i want you to be able to absorb it and learn it and know what all these scores mean to be the best you can be for your child um, remember that you are your child's first teacher and best advocate, and if it's not in writing, it didn't happen. So with that, I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day, and I will uh, see you tomorrow. Have a great night.